All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Eleanor Green Party. I'm your host, David Rich. We have a very special guest on tonight, Dr. Guy McPherson. Thank you, sir, for coming on the show. How are you? Thank you for having me. Okay. So uh, without going down the very long list of your accomplishments uh, and, and rewards and awards and so on, Dr. Guy McPherson uh, is a world-renowned scientist and he's a PhD in biology. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Who has, uh, uh, over the last several years, um, brought together uh, from, from credible sources, this is all peer-reviewed sources, I, I saw your, your lecture about that or your video about that, we have this like pile, stack of papers, I'm like, okay, you know, then you're reciting like this person, I'm like, okay, that's yeah, all credible, uh, bringing about a, a theory concerning the, the, the rate and pace at which uh, certain things are happening globally that can lead to a very, very disastrous outcome as recently as soon as 2026 and that's what really made my hair stand up like holy cow i need to talk to this guy so without further ado again welcome to the show and i'd like to like just kind of start with your trek towards this prediction however wherever you want to start in your own intellectual past scientific past sure well it was i realized a long time ago that it was the monetary system driving us to extinction that it's our our rabid quest for dollars that that has a sacrificing principle at every turn 100%. so that we have a few bucks so i opted out of the monetary system i stopped taking paychecks on may 1st 2009 so today's my anniversary wow. my what 14 year anniversary of not taking paychecks how did you and how do you how do you survive just barely Okay. <laughs> fair. <laughs> I saved money when I was making money. Okay, fair. And and I have a monetized YouTube channel. And oh. and that's it, you know, and I I live very frugal. you know, when I was a kid a very long time ago, my parents were very frugal. We lived in a a village in northern Idaho, and sometimes you couldn't get to the grocery store. It, it was a 3-hour drive the way it was. And in the winter, Sometimes you just didn't make the monthly trip because yeah. you couldn't get through. So we learned to live frugally. And back in those days, it wasn't such a bad thing. You know, in the 60s and 70s, frugality was viewed as a, as an attribute, something that people would want to do. Uh -huh. And and now we call those people cheap. <laughs> right. 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 And so so I live frugally and I I get by. And I get about three hundred dollars a month from people who appreciate my work and who give me donations to continue going. But you know, if you if you live for what you need instead of for what you want, you can actually get by pretty well in the world without a lot of money. Right. At least that's been my experience. So mine as well. I can literally fit every material thing I own in my truck. Mm -hmm. Like, I just don't, I don't care about stuff. I'm, again, I'm a philosopher. I'd rather read and think. Right, and, right. And so find fulfillment that way. <laughs> so I'm, I moved to Belize several years ago in, oh, cool. in a small SUV. And then I made the trip back to this country in, on commercial air. So every, everything I own fits in a couple or three suitcases. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Very cool. Okay, so okay, so that's the, kind of the beginning of your track towards this this current theory and prediction. What came right. next? Right, and so it was only after I left active service at the university. I'm professor emeritus. What that means is retired with honors, and what it means is I can do everything I was doing before, except get paid. So I can teach courses on campus or by Zoom through through the University of Arizona as I was doing before, but I'm busily doing other things instead. So I didn't realize there was such a thing as abrupt irreversible climate change until a few years after I left active service and I was living in a very remote area in southwestern New Mexico and still trying to keep up with the literature. I, I still had access to the renowned library at the University of Arizona, so I was able to keep up with things. and things started looking really bad and then they started looking really worse and suddenly there was this thing called abrupt climate change whereas previously abrupt climate change meant over thousands of years this new version of abrupt climate change meant we would lose habitat 
within as little as six months or six weeks. And so that was a cause for concern. So I started going down that path and again, all relying upon the scholarship of other people because I didn't have the funds to be conducting research myself. So I was, I was doing what's called secondary research, not primary research. <clears throat> Whereas when I was on campus, I was doing primary research and building rain out shelters with graduate students and applying water and changing the environment and seeing what the plant response was. Um, since I, since 2009, I've been operating solely by relying upon the work of other people. And I can't remember when all that started, but it was on June 20th, 2012, that I posted a blog post indicating that climate change was abrupt and irreversible. So that was June 20th, 2012. Interestingly, with two separate reports, the IPCC concluded in on the 8th of October, 2018, and then on the 24th of September, 2019, less than a year apart, they concluded that climate change was abrupt and irreversible respectively in those two reports. I'm, I'm reminded of something that Robert, uh, oh, why is the name escaping me now? Um, the science fiction, the American science fiction writer. Heinlein, right. Oh, okay. Robert Heinlein once wrote, uh, being right too soon is socially inconvenient. <laughs> That's true. And, and that certainly has been the case for me. I yeah. pointed out that we were in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change in 2012. The IPCC comes along, does the same thing in 2018 and 2019 and nobody's taken issue with the IPCC reaching that conclusion but man did they take issue with me reaching that conclusion yeah and that's something I also noticed when like after I discovered you and invited you on the show and, and kept doing more research on you and, and your, your your claims uh, the IPCC is not necessarily disagreeing with your your conclusions I don't know if they're willing to take uh, the, the 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 step of like saying 2026 um, but they I do know that they have said and other scientists have said that the methane released when the glacier is melting could literally happen at any moment. Now, they just sort of leave it open like that, which is still a very urgent claim. Right. A claim with a great deal of urgency. Um, but it doesn't have a specific time. Um, but go ahead. Sorry, I, I just want to put right. that. No, no. As you said, the IPCC is a very conservative organization, as you mentioned before. And I had heard this well before that, that video of yours. Um, is that it takes them because it's all kind of intertwined with government regulations and bureaucracy and red tape. So it takes them a long, the, 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 when they put out a paper, this is why they're constantly updating their, their papers. Right. Uh, oh, it's because the, the, the initial one, the big one that they put out, the report say is like five, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, you know, <laughs> so then right. they, then they put out some other like smaller papers saying, Oh, by the way, it's a lot worse than that. Right. Absolutely. Every time. Now, it's interesting, um, Princeton professor Michael Oppenheimer wrote a piece on the Environmental Defense Fund blog on November 1st, 2007. It's called How the IPCC Got Started. And he points out that the IPCC, which was established during the Reagan administration, um, actually was designed to fail. Okay. And man, have they done so. So here's some of the things he writes. Um, U.S. support was probably critical to the IPCC's establishment. The U.S. government, again, this is the Reagan administration, saw the creation of the IPCC as a way to prevent the activism stimulated by my colleagues and me from controlling the policy, policy agenda. I suspect that the Reagan administration believed that most scientists were not activists and would take years to reach any conclusion on the magnitude of the threat. Even if they did, they probably would fail to express it in plain English. And so imagine the surprise of the Reagan administration and subsequent presidential administrations in the United States that the IPCC is actually speaking in relatively straightforward language that things are in pretty bad shape. So uh, again, from the October 8th, 2018 report, global warming of 1.5 degrees, even abrupt geophysical events do not approach 
current rates of human-driven change. This is this is the most rapid change in planetary history. Right. That's what we're talking about here. So that's a that's a big big deal, and yeah. you don't see the corporate media ever reporting on that, which which came from a very conservative source. Yes, and also just to mention, uh, as far as like a, a past uh, tipping point, uh, there's what 440 parts per million carbon dioxide in the air nowadays, measurably. And right. uh, what's that? Play, Pleiocene. Yes. Uh, uh, levels. Mid, yeah, mid Pleiocene levels. Okay, so you know, unless you have a giant like vacuum that can suck it out of the air, I don't know how you're going to come <laughs> back from that. So and, it's and already, in a sense, over. And I think a lot of people who would agree that it's 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 not stoppable. And then maybe we should change our, our, our focus on policy, but how to survive it, which still kind of put it towards the end of the century. I like to see right. that a lot. By the end of the century, then it's, I mean, it's, everybody's like, right. it's over. Or, <laughs> or by 2050. Or, or by or 2050, sure. Far enough in the future that current generation doesn't have to worry about it. It's something that's for future generations. I see that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, you have, you have 2026. So you, can we, can we, Go there now, or do you want to wait till? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We can definitely go there. Why? Why three years from now? Uh, because <clears throat> James Anderson and Jennifer McKinnon predicted an ice-free Arctic Ocean um, to occur by now, by this year, and it looks like it's not going to happen this year. So I would love for us to be able to stretch that out for another few years. However, if we have an ice-free Arctic Ocean next year or the year after. We're still talking about loss of habitat within a few months after. So, you know, we, yes, we've dodged one bullet, but we're facing a Gatling gun. The bullets are flying from from many directions at the same time. So, you know, I would love to re receive some assurance that we will have ice floating on the Arctic Ocean from now till 2050, but I think that's essentially impossible based on the rate of change that we're seeing so far uh, with respect to the melting of that ice. Right. And also I know that uh, concerning the, the ice in the Arctic, uh, both North and South Pole is that uh, definitely in the North Pole, there's like the, the, these, like the, what's the one in Greenland, the the, 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 the Thacier Glacier? Oh. The, the Doomsday Glacier. Right. Yeah. I don't remember. Okay, uh, like it's it's you mentioned before in your other videos, and this is something important that we definitely talked a lot about in system science, uh, is a feedback loop. And most right. of nature, if not all of nature, is a set of it, almost an infinite set of different smaller types of feedback loops. Smaller ones get into bigger ones. So basically, just to get the basic logic of a feedback loop, is that causally speaking, A uh, causes B, B causes C, C comes back around and causes A to become greater than or different somehow, which causes B, which causes C, which then go back. So it's just like this. It's called, in logic, it's called recursive logic. In, 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 in biological, geological systems, it's called a feedback loop. Right, or a self-reinforcing feedback loop. Or self-reinforcing Because, feedback because it self-reinforces. Yeah. And, and it's, <clears throat> you know, at some point, I, I've identified more than 60 of these on my blog in, in a very long essay that I stopped updating several years ago. And then the IPC comes along. It's incredibly conservative with this approach, as, as pointed out in the incredibly conservative journal Bioscience, yeah. peer-reviewed. And that was in the March 2019 issue of, Bio, of Bioscience. And so we know it's conservative. And yet the IPCC has concluded that climate change is irreversible based on an overheated ocean. Here we are looks like we're headed into a very significant El Nino Southern Oscillation, oh, yeah. which will release many, many gigatons of carbon dioxide and abundant heat from the ocean. And so that could well be the trigger for loss of habitat, loss of habitat for humans. I hope not, but we've been in a, a La Nina episode for a very long time much longer than it typically happens. And so I, I just don't see us avoiding an El Nino Southern Oscillation event in the near future, probably starting this fall. And if that's the case, there's going to be a lot of heat released from the ocean. That's, that's going to be seriously problematic. 
Yes, and this is something else that I, I looked into recently as well. And there are a lot of very top scientific agencies across from Europe to America to all over the uh, world, Australia, who say the exact same thing about the Southern Oscillation and the El Nino is, is all this all the signs are in place for it to happen. Um, right. It would almost be a miracle for it not to, you know, right. kind of thing. Uh, and it's a very right. it's as dangerous as you're describing. Can you tell the viewers like what is La Nina and what is El Nino? Yeah, so they have to do with sea surface temperatures. When the sea surface temperature is relatively cool, that's a La Nina event. There's there's three phases. There's La Nina, which is the cool cycle. There's the neutral phase, and there's the El Nino Southern Oscillation. The El Nino Southern Oscillation. You can you can think of the ocean as a battery, and it stores a lot of heat and a lot of greenhouse gases, most notably including carbon dioxide. So when the El Nino Southern Oscillation comes along, heat and carbon dioxide are released at a very high level from the world's ocean. And that increase in heat, as well as the increase in carbon dioxide, further contribute to the, self the idea of self-reinforcing feedback loops. More carbon dioxide, more heat, causes more carbon dioxide and more heat. So that's almost certain to occur based on everything I've heard, including NOAA's analysis, National Atmosphere, whatever NOAA stands for, sorry. The National, National, of Atmospheric, uh, National, National Oceanic, Oceanic <laughs> and Atmospheric Administration. Yeah, that's it. There you go. <laughs> anyway, so there, again, conservative analysis indicates that we're headed for an El Nino I think the only question at this point is how how severe is this El Nino going to be? Is it going to be a big one like the one that happened, I think it was in the late 80s, 87 to 88, 89 maybe? Is it going to be a monster like that or is it going to be more mundane? Now, coming on the in the aftermath of a very long La Nina event, I strongly suspect we're headed for a very significant El Nino event. So that tells me that there's going to be a lot of heat released into the atmosphere and a lot of carbon dioxide that's going to further accelerate the heating that's already <laughs> underway. If so, that might well be sufficient to cause loss of habitat for human animals on this planet. And if not, then the emergence of an ice-free Arctic Ocean in the, you know, that's still, it hasn't gone away. It, we didn't have it happen. It looks like it's not going to happen this year. I'd say with great certainty, it's not going to happen this year. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen next year or the year after. And, mm -hmm. and that will lead to within several months, very, an incredible loss of albedo and a superheating of the planet as a result. Will that lead to first responders in the absence of a habitat, first responders not responding anymore and, and going home to their family and friends? Probably. And so what that means is the nuclear plants start melting down. And that's enormously problematic as demonstrated in the 2021 film Finch. Very subtly. Finch? Yes. I haven't heard of this. I need to check. Oh. Okay. It's a, it's a Tom Hanks movie. And it came out at almost the same time as Don't Look Up. And I think Don't Look Up got a lot of the attention. Yeah, I saw that And, one. Okay. Oh, and I cool. loved the final scene of yeah. Don't Look Up. Yeah, that's right. But cool. everything else about the two films, I was a huge fan of Finch instead. Finch like the bird, because right. that's that's the name of Tom Hanks's character. Okay. <clears throat> and... <clears throat> And somehow the writers in this 2021 film, which probably was written in 2020 or before, so they know about nuclear power plants melting down and cause superheating of the planet enough so that if you, if you put bare human flesh out under the sun within a matter of minutes, it was actually a matter of seconds in the film, but, you know, artistic license, in a matter of minutes, you'll get sunburn. That's what happens when you have ionizing radiation stripping away stratospheric ozone. And that's what will happen when we have nuclear power plants melt down. What are there, like 440 across the planet? Is that what you said? 
Yeah, there's there's more than 440. Okay. So and it, so it's not going to take <clears throat> all of them even melting down, you know, before it's going to produce catastrophic outcomes. And so that's probably my greatest concern in terms of loss of habitat for all life on Earth. And, you know, people thought I was crazy about that for a while. And then Strona and Bradshaw published their paper in 2018, indicating that a five to six degree temperature rise will be sufficient to cause the loss of all life on Earth. And that was over a, sp a span of hundreds of years. And the, the, the kind of rate of change we're talking about from the standpoint of environmental change in the near future is much faster than that with the, with the stripping of a stratospheric ozone as a result of ionizing radiation escaping those nuclear, nuclear power plants. We're talking about, <clears throat> at, at the very least, 8 or 10 C temperature increase and probably much more than that in a very short period of time, so fast that organisms can't keep up. You know, based on the peer-reviewed literature, we're already at the point that vertebrates can't keep up. That from a from a paper by, mm, oh, it escapes me now, in 2013, this 2013 paper points out that vertebrates can't keep up. Well, mammals can't keep up either based on the results of a more recent paper. And people are both. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We fall into both categories. That's of, the double whammy. On us. Of yeah. Can't keep right. up. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if vertebrates can't keep up and mammals can't keep up when we're vertebrate mammals. That right. tells me that we're in some kind of trouble. Yeah, for sure. Um, can you elaborate a little bit? Because, like, I understand that what you're saying is that, like, you know, but, but as, as things get worse, you know, you only have each each species only has a, a type of type of being, if you will, on the earth can only do so much for its, its own propagation and procreation. Um, so I understand what you mean by not being able to keep up with stuff. But can you give like more specific examples? Like, is it food supplies that we're gonna like go to the wayside that we're not gonna be able to eat as much and or, or, or have as much nutrients right. to live? Right. As, as big organisms, we depend upon a lot of other organisms for our own survival. <clears throat> yeah. Where do we get our clean water? Yeah. We think that it comes from a water treatment plant. But mm -hmm. for hundreds of thousands of years, humans lived with clean water that they, they drank out of a stream. I did that when I was a kid growing up in northern Idaho. I wouldn't oh, yeah, do I it today, but, but I could do it 50 years ago, and it wasn't a big deal. So that's an indication that we're losing habitat right there. We no longer have potable water that we can drink right from nature. We have to, we have to clean it at the, at the plant, at the water treatment plant. Now... We also depend upon a lot of organisms to overcome our hunger. So if we're going to eat healthy food, what that means is, first and foremost, we need a lot of invertebrates. We need a lot of insects that are pollinating all the plants that we are ultimately eating. And that's, you know, most people don't understand that carrots don't come from the grocery store. All those carrots that you see at the grocery store were actually grown someplace else and then were brought to the grocery store after a growing season, long enough, 60 to 90 days or whatever, for them to grow big enough that they could be commercially valuable and show up on the shelves of the grocery store. So there's two things. There's water that we're badly contaminating already and food, and we are destroying the ability to grow food. We're in the midst of an insect apocalypse that's been wow repeatedly reported in peer-reviewed journals dating back about five years ago. So if we're kill all, killing all the insects and we depend upon those insects for our survival, that tells me that we're in trouble. Yeah. So, On a totally different front. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, it's, there are it's a multitude insect of sectors and fronts we're, we're, we're destroying or, you know, yeah, exactly. Right. So it's an insect apocalypse. It's we're contaminating the water. We're overpopulating the planet. Yeah. Uh, how much do we need? Really? <laughs> I mean, that's a question I used to ask my students. And they all thought we needed a lot more than I thought we needed. They probably still do. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, um, and I got to the point a few years ago where I, I just sort of had it with deniers. Like, okay, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Uh, your mistaken reasoning is dangerous to the rest of us. Um, it's not okay. Um, that kind of thing. I mean, I didn't, you know, physically threaten to like go to fisticuffs or anything, but I mean, like, it's definitely like, I'm just, I'm done listening to you. Um, I've had it. I listened to you for a long time because I had my own questions and, and, and concerns about climate change theories. It's not, not that I ever didn't believe it, but I'm like, I didn't have my own sort of like epistemological cert certitude. Um, and I needed that for me to kind of like put, put full faith in our stock in a, a theory. Um, sure. And you know, everybody <clears throat> I know, including me, would like to think that there's no such thing as anthropogenic climate change. Right. That climate change just comes in cycles related to the Milankovitch cycle, for example. And it oh, just comes yeah, along. About this. You know, so it just comes along every few hundred thousand years. It's nothing for us to worry about. We didn't right. do it. We weren't even there that day. Right. <laughs> I mean, everybody would like to believe that. And so when they see somebody on television who has credentials saying that, then of course it's, oh, whew, problem solved. All those, <laughs> you know, all those rabid environmentalists were wrong this whole time. Glad we got that over with. Right, and there's the, and that's a very good point to make, uh, to emphasize, is that, like, I, like we said, I think before the show, is that a lot of people, the deniers, they point at models in the past, again, from like the population bomb and, and elsewhere, uh, that these sort of exact predictions did not come to fruition. Therefore, all predictions are false. And the whole thing is a hoax. And again, there's a huge leap in logic there, my friends. Okay. Like you were saying that the, the uh, James and I forget the other person's name, you know, predicted by this year, we'd have an ice free Arctic that didn't happen. What those deniers would say, therefore it's never going to happen. Exactly. No. It just right. means that probably it's going to happen a little later, but it's definitely going to happen. Right, right. We we, we dodged a bullet, but right. again, it's a Gatling gun. The bullets are still coming. We managed to avoid one. That doesn't mean we're done. Right. right. That So that again, that's James Anderson, the Harvard atmospheric scientist, and Jennifer McKinnon, the University of California. That's it, sir. So, so and, and actually, McKinnon actually said, and this was on release of a paper that she was the lead author on for Nature Communication, which is an open access journal. And upon release of that paper, she was interviewed by CBS News, April 23rd, 2021. And she said she expects this ice cream Arctic Ocean in 2022, but it might be in 2023. Right. You know, and so it didn't happen yet. And I couldn't be happier about that. I made a video about exactly that, pointing out that we get another year based on the worst case scenario, which is a nice free Arctic Ocean. So we get another year and we should be celebrating and, but, but not acting as if we just won the lottery and we get another thousand years, right, right, right. which, <laughs> you know, we get another 365 days. Yeah. Which, yeah. which admittedly, depending upon how you live, 365 days can be a long time. If you oh, live with sure. grat gratitude, if you live with urgency, that's a long time. You can get a lot done in a week, in a day, in an hour. You no, know, it's astonishing how much you can do in a low spot. Like, I, this literally, this might be a little more funny than anything, but like before the show, like I went off, it was it was like 7 or 6.41. I went off and I did a bunch of stuff, seemingly came back and it was 7.43. And I remember like, wow. Like, I just did all that in two minutes, um, stuff like that. But I mean, so yeah, I mean, you can really have a, a full experience, a full life in, in, in a short period of time for sure. Um, right. And, and, and I see so many people who think they have forever to live. They think they're going to live into their 80s or 90s, like everybody does, right, in, in first world countries. And so as a result, they don't live with urgency. They don't live as if every day matters. They live as if there's only the the future in the very distant future, and that used to be me, and that's why I had so much money when I, when I quit working, and and so I can still persist on that money. But increasingly, I realize that that's not the way to live, at least not for me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Minimalism is a beautiful, simple way of living. Simplicity is so wonderful. You right. know, <laughs> how a life, like a leading a good life became so complicated 
Uh, I don't know. Probably. Well, a lot of it has to do again, like with money and profit and tech, you know, all sorts of nonsense. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there were so many authors pointing that out in the late sixties, you know, through the 1970s, the notion of simplicity. Well, yeah, Henry David Thoreau. Yes. That was, the even, that was even kinda, before. The kicked it off. Yeah. I mean, he kind of kicked that whole thing off. <laughs> right. You know, uh, for sure. Um, okay, well, let's talk more about the glaciers because um, I think that's a big part of, of what is, is going on here. Uh, this, this, no, the amount of methane uh, uh, contained in, in these glaciers and the rate at which that they are, are uh, consistently melting. Um, talk about the, the amount of methane and like how it can, like, do you suspect in 2026 that they're going to melt to a point where like the 100 billion tons are just going to emit right away? Oh, no. Okay. No, no. And first of all, the emissions will be locally and then regionally, and then we'll, we'll cover the planet, okay. right? So, but methane is already, we're, we're in serious trouble just because methane is at such a high level. Uh, what is it? Two and a half times what it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, yes. roughly 1750. Yes. So that's kind of a big deal all by itself. And Methane, although it's it's measured in parts per billion, not parts per million, a methane molecule is at least a hundred times more powerful than a carbon dioxide molecule is at warming the area beneath it. So the power of a methane molecule of CH4 is very, very strong. And mm -hmm. even though it's measured in parts per billion, it's still a big deal. So you can you can take that parts per billion. Right, so I don't even remember what we're at now. But do you do you have a good number, relatively recent, of methane in the atmosphere? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's 1950. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. So 1950, it's it's in parts per billion. So that's only 0.195 parts per million. Right, no, one point nine five parts per million. Right, so the the part the the partializing of it. Go ahead, sorry. But it's a hundred times more powerful than carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Well, and also I don't want people to like think that because it's a small portion of a larger uh, sum that it has negligible or no literally no effect. Uh, just think about the the COVID, the COVID virus is two microns big and can kill you. Okay, so I mean, just very, very small things can have very, very, and you can go into like the butterfly effect and chaos theory and kind of that kind of like the interconnectedness of things. Don't let the, the, the proportion of small to big within the same collective uh, uh, discourage you from believing that this is true because that's simply not the case. Right. I, I don't see a lot of people taking a small amount of cyanide because it's just a small. Right. Just because it's just like, oh, just take it and I'll be fine. No, you're, you're yeah. going to die. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Speaking, going back to Thoreau from earlier, naturalists during that time, throughout the 1800s and early 1900s, would use apple leaves or cherry leaves in a kill jar. Because if you crush them and put them in the yeah. kill jar, they release cyanide. Yeah. And so that's all it takes to kill If you crack cherry. open a cherry seed and like lick the inside, there's a very high likelihood you will die. Yeah, you know- and it's a cherry seed that you get a jewel. There's a naturalist way back in the day, 1840s, I think it was, in the in the United States, northeastern <clears throat> United States, who bet that he could eat a cup of apple seeds and it wouldn't kill him. Okay. He lost. Yeah, he, he's, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's really uh, odd to me. You know, they do that. it's a cup. And it, well, naturalists back in those days took their, took their work very seriously. There's another naturalist who wanted to see how fast it would take a porcupine quill to go through human muscles. So he stabbed it into his calf and walked around and measured it till it came out the other side. Wow. Oh. You know, this is taking your life very seriously. Yeah, this no, there's, there's also like, I mean, the, I find the world, the physical universe to be beautiful, absolutely. Um, but a beautiful metaphysically or, or mathematically, which is a lot of the beauty of nature, um, does not mean that it's always going to be nice to you. Right. You know, remember, I mean, nature provides us with life and, and sustenance. It also will kill you. Yes. That's how it goes. goes. Sorry. <laughs> it's almost as if nature... Nature bats out. last. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Never forget that. Um, <laughs> methane, going back to methane. Methane is, is, is 
far more contains more heat uh, than than carbon dioxide molecule by a, a, as much as like well, I heard eighty something percent more than a carbon dioxide one would right. and you, last in the first. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, you, you frequently see eighty times as much, but it's at least a yeah. hundred times as much in the okay. short term. And we're talking about short-term changes here. Okay, right. So over yeah. this over a span of a hundred years, yes, it's only eighty times as powerful. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about methane being released right now today, right. and increasing in volume in the atmosphere. Right. Not the, not the in twenty one years. years. Yes. So for the next decade, we're talking about a hundred times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So you multiply by 100 times. So if we're at 1.95 parts per billion, that's 195, I mean, parts per million, then we're at 195 equivalent parts per million to CO2. So you tack on that roughly 200 to the roughly 400 carbon dioxide, and just those two alone takes us to about 600 parts per million equivalent CO2. And, And those are two of 43 greenhouse gases. What does that mean? The, those are two of the greenhouse gases. Oh, two of 43. Green, I think there, it's there, 40. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, there are 41 others that we haven't even factored into the equation yet. Wow. Okay, like what? Well, the most abundant of them is water vapor. And the feedback is incredibly rapid, right? So it gets warmer on Earth that evaporates more water, goes up into the atmosphere, forms a lens sort of like a, the, the magnifying glass some people used when they were children to kill ants with, right? And so mm-hmm. that's, that's water vapor in the atmosphere amplifying the heating effect. And within a few hours or a few days, causing even more m- evaporation of water, thereby increasing the evaporative effect. And... The, I, I'm not going to be able to list all 43 of them. That's okay. Um, because but, I, the, on the water vapor thing, that brings up another topic, which is just shows about like concerning feedback loops and the position we put ourselves in that we just by uh, the, the, the things we've done, we can't escape um, uh, is aerolizing the aerolizing factor. Is that what it's called? Is that how you pronounce it? Or is it aerolization? Yeah. Aerosols. Aerosols. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The, Can we the talk aer- about that? Yeah, yeah. What what almost nobody knows, because it, I, I swear it's the best kept secret in climate science, is that at the same time industrial activity puts those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which down the road warms the planet by acting as a greenhouse. At the same time we're doing that with industrial activity, we're also putting up aerosols. These aerosols go up into the atmosphere and prevent the light from getting in and striking the earth to begin with. So it can strike it and warm it up if it never hits. So you can think of the aerosols. This is sometimes called the aerosol masking effect. The aerosols going up into the atmosphere and reflecting incoming sunlight before it strikes the planet, sending it back out into space where it came from, from the sun. And this is huge. Um, the, The latest paper I've seen was in Nature Communications 2021 by... Ja, I think it's pronounced Ja in colleagues, J-A-I. And it indicates that the overall heating will be an increase of about 55% compared to where we're at now. James Hansen has said in many presentations, many interviews, that the aerosols fall out within about five days. So they're constantly falling out of the atmosphere. And if we don't maintain industrial activity, if we don't keep flying our planes and driving our cars and putting those aerosols into the atmosphere, they're all going to fall out within five days. And the heating of the planet will be very rapid and very severe. This is a big deal that almost nobody knows anything about because nobody ever talks about it. Oh, here we go. I've, I've got the paper right here in front of me. And it was published June 15th, 2021 in Nature Communications called Significant Underestimation of Radiative Forcing by Aerosol Cloud Interactions Derived from Satellite-Based Methods. By accounting for the 
sampling biases of previous papers, they point out that the magnitude of aerosol masking increases by 55% globally. I mentioned that number. That's a big number because we're already above 2, above 2C, above the 1750 baseline. And they indicate that that's 133% over land and 33% over ocean. Well, most of us live on land. Right. So 133% increase as a result of loss of aerosols is a really big deal. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that it's a good idea to maintain industrial activity, that we should put the pedal to the metal and everybody should fly on a plane when they got a, a one-hour commute into work. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that there are trade-offs here that almost nobody knows about, much less has thought about. And we have to take care of both sides of the equation, not just the one factor reducing greenhouse gases, but also taking into account what happens when we reduce industrial activity and the aerosol falling out of the atmosphere as a result. This is a, this is a very complicated matter. And the one effort that I've seen that I think could have done a good job at dealing with both sides of this equation, I think is moving too slowly to be useful. And that's the MIR reflection framework, which you can find at MIR.org. MIR in this case is spelled M-E-E-R. It, All right, because I was going to ask about that next. Good. Okay, so let's. I just saw a video by I think the originator. Who? What's his name? Doctor Yatao. Yatao. Yes, exactly. Uh, just mm -hmm. the other day, um, but you brought that up in several of the videos I saw you in. Um, so why don't you tell us what Mir is? M E E R. So, <clears throat> and and it's I can't ever remember the the acronym. That I, my mind does not understand acronyms either, man. Like I always <laughs> have struggled with them because I guess because the letter can mean anything. I don't know. I've always I gotta like sound it out and like think about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. So so Dr. Tao was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard through the Roland Institute, and he heard about my work, and I wasn't too far out of his way when he was going to or returning from a conference. So he stopped by to see me when I lived in New York, just about an hour north of the city. And and he was in, he had been thinking about ways that that as a physicist, he would be able to make a significant dent in the the planetary crisis that we are in the midst of. And he recognized that we are in the midst of it. So this was 2018, I believe. And so he went back to the lab and came up with this idea of mirrors, physical mirrors on ground or in the ocean, pretty much anywhere. And obviously more effective in some places than in others. But the idea is to reflect back incoming sunlight before it strikes and warms up the planet. Right. And so that's the whole idea of the mirror reflection framework right. is to do that as if we're in the in the midst of an emergency, which we are, which we are. Yeah. and and get as many mirrors out there as quickly as we can. For their construction, they depend only upon sand, which is still sort of available out there. So we can we have enough sand to make mirrors still. And so doing, really just a typical mirror, not anything special. That's right. Okay. And, and typically raised up on a pole or put on rooftops. Some people who have adopted the idea have been putting mirrors on the rooftops yeah. in, in cities, for example. Anything we can do to reflect incoming sun, sunlight back into space before it has a chance to warm the earth and contribute to the greenhouse effect is a good idea. And so that's been the entire approach. It seemed relatively simple. Obviously, even if it is relatively simple, it's been five years now, and it's difficult to get something like that off the ground. And as nearly as I can tell, no billionaire and no government of the world has taken it, taken the project under its wing and sort of made sure that it happened. And I think that's terrible. Because it, it, I think it was the last best chance to preserve habitat for our species and many others on what I think is the most beautiful planet. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> What 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 do you expect when you say all life on the planet? Do you mean the word all literally? Yes. It's not and, and, sort of like a hyper hyperbolic like I mean like every microbe everything gone. Yes, and and here again I'm I'm only quoting previous literature in this case from scientific reports, which is part of the Nature series, and it's by Giovanni Strona and Corey Bradshaw. The paper is titled Coextinctions Annihilate Planetary Life During Extreme Environmental Environmental Change. And the extreme environmental change is five to six degrees Celsius over a, a few hundred years. This paper was published November 13th, 2018, and it points to literally the loss of all life on Earth. Now, that said. Even the oceans? Yes. Okay. Yes. All life on Earth, okay. and there's been work that has been published, peer-reviewed work again, since this paper came out, indicating that even tardigrades, the go-to survivor for people who can't believe that all life on Earth will be lost, tardigrades are very sensitive to high temperatures, as it turns out. Yeah. So. And, you know, they, they talk in here. Let's see if I can find the quote I'm looking for. Earth wandering across the universe could still have some tiny chance of blooming again under some lucky and unlikely circumstances. At a five to six degree global average temperature rise, that's what they're talking about. Unlikely, lucky and unlikely circumstances. Is there a theoretical possibility of like a different type of living creature that could survive in that heat and that environment coming? I mean, you ever watch Jurassic Park with, you know, Jeff Goldblum's character saying life always finds a way? I actually never saw that movie or, or okay. any other, basically any other movie that you name. Okay. But, <laughs> But it's interesting because when I realized that the 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 motto for this set of living arrangements for industrial civilization is must go faster. Oh, yeah. That's what I've been saying for years. Must go faster. That's what everybody thinks we need to do. And so I started looking for must go faster. And all I found was clip after clip of, of a dinosaur trying to crunch Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> and apparently he was yelling must go faster from the back of a pickup truck. Interesting. Into. Interesting. That's I, I didn't pick up on that, but that's a, that's a, a, like a like a, a, a yeah, an Easter egg kind of thing in the movie, maybe as symbolic of something else, like industrialized society. That's interesting. Um. Yeah. I don't. I okay. So, I know we only have a few minutes left here. Um. You have this kind of like consensus it, that it, uh, see see like, see even I'm not as radical as you. I say we have more than a few minutes. No man. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, but um, that's that was very funny. Um, uh, what the hell is I was going to say? Uh, oh, so like at the they, 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 there's a, a consensus you know, with the IPCC and, and elsewhere globally that we need to reduce carbon emissions. No mention of any other type of thing. Uh, the 43 other ones or 42 other ones um, by the by 45 percent by the year 2030. And it really doesn't look like that's going to happen because you said, you know, uh, the number one word for all these problems, folks, is profit. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm not even kidding. And you said it too. I mean, you said money, but I mean, it's it's the, right. the greedy, uh, the greed and, you know, project, you know, trying to get as much as possible by just destroying everything because you don't care. It's just monstrous. Um So, and some people think that, that uh, if that doesn't happen, there's a 2050 uh, uh, deadline as well that if we can reduce emissions by carbon emissions by 45% by 2030, then get to net zero by 2050, we should be okay. Now, let's say by some wonderful, miracle, magical, some spell wizards or something like that, cast a spell on the North, uh, North Pole and the South Pole and, so, and all the ice remains as it is. Let's say just, and like you said, hopefully your prediction of 2026 uh, comes, 2026 comes and goes, everybody's fine. Um, what about those other predictions by the more conservative scientists? I mean, is there, what would you say about those? Well, they're conservative 
Okay, I mean, so it's just okay. but but you know I'm not I'm not saying let's just throw them out. Um, we we're in real trouble, and if we can get people to acknowledge that we're in real trouble, then maybe we can do a Manhattan Project at the global scale, and treat the climate crisis if it's as if it's a crisis, which it is. And if we can do that, and if we can get through the next few years with ice floating on the Arctic Ocean, then maybe we'll have a chance. Right. I mean, that's my big concern because the Arctic is the planetary air conditioner. That's yeah. Those are words in science, yeah, one no, of the two renowned journals in the world by Mark C. Urban in a one-page paper. So it's the planetary air conditioner. If we don't take care of it, we are in real trouble, and we are not taking care of it. The ice is melting the Arctic Ocean at a stunningly rapid rate. And maybe we just should have not been paying attention and not put a satellite up in there in 1979 and started measuring it. And then we wouldn't know any better. And then it would all melt. And we'd just go away. But now that we know, now that we know better since 1979, the amount of ice that has melted is astonishing. And maybe we should take that a little bit seriously. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and again, the people in power political and economic power don't seem to be agreeing enough uh, to get anything accomplished. Even like, again, the 2026 thing aside, just the 2030, 2050 thing. Um, so even if by chance, you're, you know, your, your prediction doesn't come to fruition, we're still screwed. It's just, you might have another seven or eight years, but like, you know, <laughs> so besides yeah. maybe a couple more than three, but I mean, it's, 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 it's over guys. And, and I would love to think, that I'm wrong on all fronts, that everybody I quote is wrong as well. And the scientists are just making this up to scare people, right? That would be awesome as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> if we found out that the scientists were all involved in this grand conspiracy and they just been making it up as a, as a means of virtue signaling. I don't think that's the case, but I would love to believe it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm still reasonably young. Yeah, I mean, I feel great. I mean, I just got I had a doctor's appointment the other day. My numbers aren't great, but I mean, I still got another twenty years. Um, so, you know, I mean, just of, in, of my own self. But um, so, okay, again, we have now even less minutes left. Um, what? What? I talked to a friend of mine today. I think you know, Lauren, you're probably watching right now. She's like, you know, like given that all he says is true, what are we supposed to do? Isn't it like, what do you want? I mean, what if it's over? It's all like, what am I supposed to do? As of right now, sitting here, what would you say? Because you talk about like we're living an excellent life and stuff like that. Like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You should live as if your life is short, which it is, regardless. <laughs> right? When I was touring right. Western Europe, this was six or seven years ago. The world's oldest human being at the time died. She was 117 years old. And mm -hmm. at her 117th birthday party, I can't even imagine it. I can barely tolerate a birthday party for me, and I'm only 63. And at the birthday party, she asked, what, what, what was that like, 117 years? And she said, it seemed rather short. She was 117. Crazy? It seemed rather short. So you think we're going to have these long lives because we make it to the age of 70 or whatever? Come on. Everybody wants more. And, and it's great. You know, living is an amazing experience. I love it myself. Big I'm thing. not ready to give up on it yet. So I would encourage people to live to live fully, to live as though your life is actually short. Because even if you live to 117, apparently that seems rather short. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm, I'm betting that nobody, nobody watching, nobody listening is going to live to be 117 years old. Unlikely. So live as though the day is here. The That's eternal true. now, if you will, if we can get a little mystical. Right. Absolutely. You know, and, People tell me all the time that their days are so long, they get bored, the blah, blah, blah. Really? How do you get bored? Really? Go out like, and I'm never bored. Take a walk in the woods. Oh, absolutely. There's yeah. so many things to do out there. Yeah, it's true. In, in nature. And it's all going away, folks. We are destroying it as fast as we possibly can. Some people want to like, I mean, okay, first of all, that's all very great, wonderful advice. I agree. You know, just live your life to the fullest while you have one. Um, but some people like are like, no, we need to like take up arms and take down the people who cause this. 
Well, just for the sake of justice, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, there's a whole other element of people that are like, no, screw that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they did this to us and, you know. You, you, you really think we're going to have justice? No, I don't. And you know, I, I had an attorney working for me pro bono. He was a renowned attorney <clears throat> and he became a friend. He slipped on a dock in the Bahamas and died on December 4th, 2020. Oh. And I'm I'm not sure he slipped on his own. And it wouldn't surprise me. He, he sued more than 100 fossil fuel companies in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. This Trita. sounds kind of familiar to me. So Gerald Maples. And Would I have heard of this in the news? Perhaps. That's okay. Anyway, I'll... I'll, I'll you know, because he sued more than a hundred com- fossil fuel companies in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, he was he was tapped in to climate change and who was responsible for it, and that that made him not the favorite person of fossil fuel companies, for what it's worth. Anyway, well, I mean, the, the fossil fuel companies lied to us for decades. There's no doubt about that. Right. We, there, we have the data. You know, Gerald had this wonderful life. He lived 63 years. That's it. Yeah, no. I'm... It's not long. 117. It seemed rather short. Yeah, that's that that really kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? It reminds me of my own. Like I'm 53 and just having like, you know, memories from however long ago, like it just seems that the interim it just seems like it went like that. Right. You know, I just talked to a buddy but we just made a camping trip uh, plan. And I was just thinking about it. I'm like, Brad, I haven't seen, we haven't seen each other in over 20 years. He's like, what? I'm like, that's how, I mean, it's just like, it seems like I just saw you maybe a few years ago, but it was actually been over 20. It's crazy how, like when it's over in retrospect, how fast it went. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is just, our individual lives are just skimming past so fast. You, you remember how when you were a kid, the days seemed so long? Yeah. It was just unbearable. Like a drag. Yeah, a, fi- a fifty-minute class in school. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to be in your twenties, and all of a sudden, everything just speeds up. Yes, that's probably what it happens. <laughs> um, we are at the end here, sir. I mean, not the end, but <laughs> we are at the end of the show. Uh, Daniel Reich, I believe it's pronounced. I want to uh, thank you for for tuning in and commenting. He's been commenting so far. He really wanted. Very excited to have you on the show. Uh, this is the most important information to share, bar none. Uh, talking about La Nina and El Nino, he said, I think we're already in the neutral phase, which I think you you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then some other things. He says, fossil fuel equals CIA. Well, I'm just, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind they have something to do with it. Got, those guys are like the most evil entity in the world. Um, anyway, and just also, just so people know, I've said this on the show before, uh, before you being waving your flags and everything else, um, the American military is the number one polluter in the, in the entire planet. Um, it, it pollutes more than any other, like well, I think, fourteen other countries combined equal. equal yes, so. yes, and that's that's just an indicator of how little control we have as individuals. Yeah, well, how are we going to stop the military from doing exactly. that? Exactly. You know, and and tack onto that, I have a friend I haven't met yet. She's a personal assistant for a billionaire, and every time the billionaire goes someplace in his private jet, he takes two. The one okay. jet flies in advance of the jet he's on to locate the air pockets. Because he can't be discomforted by hitting. Oh my God. Him. So, <laughs> so tell me again how oh. I need to not use, not burn so much gasoline when I'm going to the grocery store. Right. Exactly. They put the burden on, on us instead of the, the people that are just that. I mean, that's ridiculous that he has a plane flying. That's just <laughs> stupid. Anyway. <laughs> On that note, I'm going to have to bid you adieu, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Guy McPherson, for coming on the show. I would love to have you back on again, maybe as uh, more changes occur. We can maybe like uh, give the viewers some updates. Uh, and if we're, what are you, hopefully if you're wrong about 2026, we'll have you on the show in 2027. That would and, be uh, great. <laughs> but uh, this is not something to, to – to, I mean, I'll laugh till the day I die because laughing makes me happy. But there is urgency here, folks. This is not something to take lightly. Um, There's so much – there's so much urgency. You better be. You better start having fun. Exactly. That well, means, there you go. That means laughing. Exactly. So, thank you everybody for tuning in to the Illinois Green Party series. I'm your host, David Rich. Again, special thanks to our, our guest, Dr. Guy McPherson. Keep it up, please. You're doing a lot of good stuff. Uh, and until next time, everybody, be good. Be green. All right, there's a delay.